What's up guys? True Techno Gamer here. And I'm gonna talk about a new surprise. I didn't actually mention this previously on my channel, but there's been, well, there's been multiple upgrades, but in particular, there has been a significant upgrade to the home theater space that I have here. Introducing LG's G2 83 inch OLED. New for 2022. Um, I actually was able to get this TV as part of a, a, um, a replacement. Um, previously, as you guys may know, if you paid attention to the channel, um, and I did my home theater tour last year, and I've talked about it several times, um, I had a 77 inch C8 uh, LG OLED. Uh, that was from 2018, roughly. So I was able to get this TV as a replacement uh, because the previous C8 had some issues and was still covered under warranty, which is great. I didn't have to pay full price and I was able to get a meaningful upgrade. So LG's G2 is their top of the line OLED TV for 2022 and it's an awesome TV. So I'm gonna talk about it and I'm gonna tell you guys the pros, the cons, what I like about it. I'm not a professional reviewer. I'm not gonna do any measurements or anything like that. I'm just gonna have a conversation with you guys. I'm gonna show the TV a little bit. I'm gonna talk about the picture quality, talk about the interface, and then just talk about my overall impressions. Uh, in short, um, the one-liner review for this TV is simply that the LG G2 represents the absolute pinnacle of LG's OLED technology. Simple as that. This is simply the best OLED TV that LG has ever made. And that's saying a lot because OLED TVs have dominated the TV market for most of the last decade or so. Um, every year, in terms of um, the ultimate picture quality that you can get, OLED has simply dominated over LEDs and LCDs and et cetera. Let's um, talk about the LG G2 for 2022. So what makes the GTV special? Well, this year is even more special than in previous years. So in the past, if you guys have followed TVs at all, LG, OLED, um, there really wasn't any difference in actual picture quality when you went across the LG line. So going from the G to the C, the core picture quality remained the same. Even back in the day when I got my E6, at the time there was a G series as well then. Um, and there was really no difference in picture quality between the E, G, the C at the time. The only differences lie in the aesthetics, some of the build quality, things like bigger sound bar, or bigger sound system, more wattage, that kind of thing, more speakers, and you know the glass design with the aesthetics. Um, now though, LG has actually made some tweaks to the G2 to push it, push the picture quality even further than what you would see in the C series this year. G2 this year actually can get brighter than the C2, and thus the C1 and the G1 from last year. Essentially, they can push it harder because the G2 actually has a built-in heat sink. Now, the heat sink is something that the Sony A90J from last year actually was the first television, OLED television to introduce. Uh, heat sink essentially means that um, the heat can be dissipated across the panel more efficiently, meaning that the panel in general would run cooler. Now what that means is that you can push, or LG can push, the brightness, which increases the heat, but they can push it further with the heat sink because they, the panel will ultimately be cooler than without a heat sink. So this year, the C2 does not have a heat sink, for example. So they're pushing that as far as it can go comfortably, you know, to keep the burning um, risk at bay without a heat sink. But this year with the G2, they actually have a heat sink so they can push it even further. So the, heat, the G2 actually does get brighter. The other advantage of the heat sink is that theoretically it will mitigate the risk of burning even more. Um, so it's more efficient and it uses less power. You know, ultimately it's a, it's a power saving thing which could save you some dollars on your electric bill. So that's the one major difference uh, this year, the LG G2, right, has a heat sink. It actually can get brighter. The other major thing that makes the G series unique, which is has been the case for a while now, is the um, flush 
mount system that it has. So that's really what the G is about. It's made for wall mounting. It comes with a built-in bracket that can allow the TV to be completely flush against the wall, making it look much more like a picture, picture frame as opposed to a television. Now, I actually don't have mine. I'm not using that because I have a power conditioner, you know, kind of surge protector connected to the wall where I have my TV plugged in. And that sticks out the wall and it prevents me from doing that. Now, I could forego that, but you know, it's a risk reward type of thing. Okay, so for my picture quality impression, let me just start with that. You know, this is as good as OLED can get. And the more time I've spent with the TV, uh, the more noticeable that has been. Um, like I said, my initial impressions when I first turned it on wasn't like, oh my God, it's just so much better coming from an LG C8 OLED. The LG C8 OLED was also, you know, pretty good. Um, besides the differences with the menu system and the web OS, um, the picture quality didn't initially blow me away. Now, part of that was I had to, you know, play around with some of the settings, the picture modes and the uh, true motion to get the motion interpolation to, to my liking. Um, things look differently. A lot of the settings have changed and are named differently than they have been in the past with the C8. I had to get used to that to find things. Um, but the more time I spent with the TV, the more I appreciate it, like, wow, like this is a sweet looking TV. It's not like dramatically different than the C8, but it is improved and I can definitely tell. So a couple of things, um, you know, checking out some, some YouTube videos in 4K and 8K, uh, which your TV isn't 8K native, but you know, just high quality. Um, and HDR, um, there was a YouTube video I found of like Japan at night, HDR, and seeing like the highlights of, from the lights, that was really noticeable. The, light, the highlights looked a lot brighter than what I remember with the C8. Um, and that was something I found like within the first week. Um, but then recently, I think last week, I was watching Pinocchio on Disney Plus, the new Pinocchio with my family. And there was a scene in there where like there's a lot of like fairy effects and kind of magical effects and such. And I'm just sitting there and I wasn't even expecting it, you know, and it just came on and I'm just like, wow. Like it was a wow moment. I'm not gonna lie. It was like, wow, this looks awesome. The highlights look brighter than I had ever seen it in my space, meaning that it looked a lot brighter than the C8. Now I've been watching a lot of stuff on the TV, but that stuck out for some reason. It was like, wow, okay, that was awesome. I don't, you know, it was awesome. Um, so there's been a couple of moments I've had like that recently where I'm like, okay, you know, even looking at some of the clarity, the processor on this thing um, is LG's most advanced processor and it's arguably the best processor on the market today. Sony typically takes the crown with their cognitive processor now and that's been the flagship, that's been kind of like the reigning thing, but LG's Alpha 9 Gen 5 processor, which is what's in this TV, um, is trading blows with that cognitive processor. Uh, I have a new Sony TV as well from my main family room that has a cognitive processor. So I've, I've seen it in action, although it's an LED TV, it's not exactly a direct comparison to this. Um, needless to say, you know, it, this processor looks good. And I'm, I'm saying that because I've just been looking at some regular HD content on my Xfinity box, on even Netflix and streaming not 4k not hdr and i'm just like it the you know i'm looking at interviews i'm looking at a world war ii documentary on, on netflix and um hd something that was made like circa 2011 2010 nothing new but the interviews with the with the people man did they not look like their faces and it just looked super super clear it was super clean it looked 4k it was hard to believe that it wasn't 4k um that's the processor. And that looks something beyond what I've been used to from the C8 for sure. I could also see that difference with the processor with games. You know, this was the most exciting aspect of getting this TV. And um, again, to be honest, initially, I didn't know what to make of it. Uh, it's weird, it's hard to explain, it didn't look bad, but I was trying to look for, you know, did it look better? And there's a lot going on here with the gaming aspect. Um, and my initial impression was like, I don't know. Okay, let me just give it more time. I don't know. Uh, it looked a little bit more vibrant, but it wasn't anything that stood out to me, I guess. And again, over time and playing more games and having a chance, one thing that happened is I actually went back and played, um, a, uh, I think it was Spider-Man Remastered on my PC. Now, 
I have a work I have a work PC and a personal PC. My work PC is pretty beefy. Um, it, it you know I have like a 3080 card in there and a 4K monitor at 60 60 hertz. So I'm playing Spider-Man on there, and I've obviously been used to playing Spider-Man here on the PlayStation 5 on, on this TV and the C8 before it. And I was just like, wow, it looked really rough. Truly rough, guys. I'm like, okay. I came back and played Spider-Man Remastered on the PS5 on the CD, and I was blown away. It was like night and day. Never mind the graphics and the, you know, the size of the GPUs and whatever. It was 4K on both cases. Um, and it just looks so much better. I can't, you know, it just looks so much better. And that's when I started to appreciate the TV more. And I'm like looking at games like Horizon Zero Dawn and Returnal and, and Grand Turismo 7 on the PS5. Even some, you know, PS4 games. Like I play Street Fighter a lot. Um, Street Fighter look, look, uh, looks awesome, you know. So now, I, you know, again, it's crazy. It's like I've gotten used to the picture quality, <laughs> but it looks amazing. It really does. Um, the vibrancy, the clarity, again, the extra processing there, the HDR imagery, um, and it just looks super clean. Like one thing I noticed, um, and I'll touch on that in a second when it comes to the size, but you know, with the C8, I used to prefer, you know, performance modes, pushing 60 hertz as opposed to, you know, really pushing 4K. Because in my experience, 4K versus 1440p, the actual raw image quality from what I see sitting in this seat with this space and this distance wasn't, Barely noticeable, barely noticeable. So for me, it's like, okay, whatever, just get the extra frames, right? Now there's a couple of things that happen that, that changes that. For one, I don't know what it is. It's probably partly the processing. It is probably also the additional size. It's not dramatically different, 77 to 83 inches, six inches diagonal is bigger, but I can feel that difference. Playing games for, in 4K looks stellar on this TV. And it looks better than I than I remember it looking on my C8. Probably, like I said, for a combination of reasons. But it looks really good here. So I'm all for 4K now. Um, and playing games like Horizon and Guarantee's Mode with the at 4K from the C. I mean, it, it it's giving me that that immersion that somehow the 77 just wasn't quite delivering. Um, Sitting back and I like the 77 I used to sit up a lot more to try to get closer to the screen. Um, I don't have to do that now. Um, and it just I, I, I see the clarity, I see the detail, I, you know, and it's, it's just great. So one common question, this is the question I was asking is, man, is it really worth it going from 77 to 83? Six inches, are you gonna feel that difference? Are you gonna see that difference? And it's kind of a silly question to ask on a forum or whatever. It really depends on you and your space. Um, there are people that are sitting close enough to a 77 inch where that's going to feel pretty big, plenty big, and, you know, give you a full sense of immersion. In this space, these chairs are roughly 12 feet away from the TV. That's pretty far. I mean, it doesn't, when you look at it in person, it doesn't look that far, but, you know, the whole chart of being able to tell the difference of resolution and whatever, um, 12 feet, yeah. I mean, I, I for a 4K screen, to really appreciate 4K versus 1080p, I really should be something close to like 110 inches according to the chart, but 83 is still a sizable side TV. And again, I can feel the difference now. It does feel better. I can notice it a lot better. Um, I, it's more enjoyable. Is it really worth it? That's a question for you to ask. Um, the price Delta does jump up dramatically going from 77 to 83. So for six inches, you gotta pay several thousand dollars more, which doesn't make sense. Um, going from 65 to 77, which is a 12 inch difference, is a lot smaller. So the price, you know, the price per inch uh, is not in the favor when you get to the 83, I will say that. Um, if you're, you know, looking for the best value, the 83 honestly is not that. But like I said, I got this as a, as a trade in or as an, a replacement, so I didn't have to pay full price. So for me, I was trying to go as big as possible. Um, and it, I feel it in this space, right? So if you can, if you have the money, go as big as possible. That's that's the general rule of thumb. Go as big as you can for the money that you, you know, what you can afford. For me now, 83 inches is at this point the largest OLED TV on the market between Sony and LG. There is a new 97 inch G2 that is just now coming out. Um, 
I'm salivating just at the thought of it. It's an awesome, that would be an awesome, awesome thing. It's way out there. It's definitely a very, very premium thing. So not gonna happen in the near future, but we'll see. Keep an eye out on that if the prices come down over the next few years. Um, sound, I'll touch on sound briefly, which is to say, I don't really have anything to say about the sound of the TV because as you can see, I'm not using the sound for the TV. Um, pretty much from the time I hooked it up, I had it connected to my stereo system here. So I don't know, right? Uh, you know, so I think most people, if you can afford to spend six grand plus on a TV and you wanna get an 83 incher, uh, you probably have at least a, a good sound bar, I would imagine, if not a full 5.1 or you know something like that. That's always gonna sound better than a TV. That's, that's what I would say. If you're getting a CD without any other sound options, uh, I'm sure the sound would suffice if that's what you're used to because you don't have a reference to compare. You don't have a you know stereo file, a surround system or even a sound bar to compare it to. This TV will, you know, I'm sure will sound pretty decent. In the past, LG TVs have had pretty good sound. I mean, I know that from my E6 in the past that had the built-in sound bar. Um, so it's not slouching there, but I couldn't vouch or say specifically you know, how it compares or how good it is or if you can use it or should use it uh, without a sound bar or a sound system. Um, with my sound system, again, it, it integrates awesome. Now, no TV is perfect, so let me talk about some of the cons with this TV. And it's not really so much cons as more just quirks. There's a bunch of quirks that did not exist. Um, I upgraded, I made several upgrades here. Um, I got a new processor, I got the new TV. And you think you get the latest and greatest things that work better and, and actually that's not the case things worked a lot smoother with my older Moranis and the older LG uh, some of that may be due to the Anthem processor and I'll talk about that in another video but in this case there are a couple perks with the, with, the, with the LG most of my issues with the LG have to do with interface things UX user experience things um, the one big bane that I have checked and does, there doesn't seem to be a good solution for there is an issue with the 83 inch TV especially where it requires you to actually turn on or press the power button twice in order to turn it on. Sounds pretty mundane, but it's annoying as hell, to be honest. And it's not, it's not just that you have to press it twice. It's not, not that you go click, click. It doesn't work like that. You gotta go click, wait about five seconds, right? And then press click again. It just breaks a lot of the experience. So for one, when my wife and my kids wanna be down here, they're used to being able to just come down here. With the old setup, they can literally take the TV remote, the LG remote, press power, and the TV will come on and everything, everything else, my amps, my processor, my subwoofers, everything else would just turn on automatically. So they have the surround sound from the system coming out and the TV is on. One click of a power button, that's it. That doesn't work now. Uh, it takes two clicks. They have to get used to that. That was an adjustment period. But even when they do that, the second quirk is that the whole handshaking and, and, and interfacing between the TV and my Anthem processor is not very smooth. Um, so the whole like HDMI linking, which I tried to enable, which means you turn on the TV and it should trigger the processor, which should then trigger everything else. That only happens now, I would say maybe, it's actually improved since I first got both pieces. I guess some firmware updates on mostly on the Anthem side, it probably helped. Um, but it only happens like maybe 50% of the time at best. Maybe more like one out of four times that it actually triggers it on. So again, it breaks that whole experience. And when my kids want to come, they're like, Daddy, I, I can't turn on the TV, it doesn't work. Right, because they pressed it once and it didn't come on, they didn't know what to do. And then I, they pressed it again and it did come on, but there was no sound because the processor didn't come on. So it's just one of those quality of life things. But again, everything worked 100% of the time before with my older equipment, right? So just think about that. Now, you know, I'm used to it a little bit, but it is annoying, right? The other part of that whole HDMI, you know, uh, link is that not only does it not trigger the Anthem to come on, but even when it does trigger the Anthem to come on, it typically doesn't actually respond to the correct input. So with the old Marantz, if I turn on the TV, the Marantz will come on and it will come on the previous input that I was watching, right? So if that was TV for cable, let's say cable, and I switch it to the game, and when I switch it to the game via the TV remote, the Marantz automatically switched to the game input so I can get the game audio. That doesn't happen here. 
It doesn't happen. Uh, it happens sometimes when I switch to the game, sometimes. Um, but if, I, if I'm in the game and try to switch back to the TV cable or back to the Blu-ray player, doesn't happen at all. So I have to go and use my uh, Logitech, which I still have these ancient things, but my Logitech Harmony remote, which has activities, that still works and that can you know turn everything where it needs to go, but it used to be a lot simpler and smoother when everything was automated, everything happened automatically. So hoping that Anthem slash LG, you know, with firmware updates continue to make that process a little bit better, but it's, it's just really not ideal. Not a deal breaker, but not ideal. Um, the other major quirk I have with the TV, again, has to do with the interface. There's a lot of like little things, simple things that used to be really accessible with the older LG and the older WebOS that is just so buried now. Um, it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> so one thing, it was looking for the serial number, trying to find that is buried in like four levels of the menu system and it's not very intuitive. Another bane has been the screensaver. So in the interest of, I guess, preventing burning, LG has the screensaver automatic and it comes on with like literally like in a minute or 90 seconds. If there's no input, like right now it's on the game and I had to switch it, I had to actually stop this video multiple times because it kept switch swapping to the screensaver and I switched it to the game input. Um, but if you just don't have an input, if you go to the LG Home, if you go to like a streaming app or whatever, within 90 seconds, 60 to 90 seconds, the screensaver is coming on. Like, and there's no way to disable it, which makes sense, I guess you don't want to necessarily disable it, but there's no way to extend the time or anything. There's no timer, there's no setting whatsoever. They removed it. Apparently there was a setting in some older version, they removed it. Um, so I've been looking for that and it just took me forever to try to find that out and apparently there is nothing there. Um, so that was like annoying. But things like, you know, um, there is an option to actually turn the screen off. So one thing that I used to like to do is, you know, sometimes just go into music mode and listen to music. <clears throat> and one thing I had with the older TV is I would go to an input and let the screen server come on. The screen server was the fireworks, uh, which this TV has, but apparently it gets disabled once you log into the LG account or something, I've heard, uh, and there's no way to re-engage it or re-enable re it unless you just do a full factory reset. How silly is that? So you can't control the screen server, you can't set the screen server. It has a built-in one, it goes away. Now it uses the clock, because I have, again, I logged in, so it's connected to the, it's gonna connect to my Wi-Fi and doing whatever. Just why? Just silliness, right? But I used to be able to do that. I love the fireworks. It kind of gave me a little bit of light, but a, a nice ambiance, right? To kind of get into the whole like club mode. There really is no way to do that. The screen service that's built in here now is it has an analog clock. Doesn't look nearly as attractive. It has, you can use the TV gallery, the art gallery. It has built in pictures. Um, those are super bright when they're on, relatively speaking. So it's like, eh. So the only other option, the only other thing like you're gonna see now, or no, it's just now. But the only other option, I guess, is from there, um, is to turn the screen off if I, and then use other ambient light I have in my space. There is an option to turn the screen off without turning the TV off. And the reason why turning the TV off uh, is not desirable is because, like I mentioned, I have my TV connected with the HDMI, you know, uh, HDMI link. Um, so when I turn the TV off, it turns everything off which is another annoying thing because when I try to play music sometimes directly streaming, you know, for airplay or whatever, um, and I'm not doing any input on the TV, depending on what the TV was on, it'll go to the screen server. And then after like another two minutes, it will turn off, completely turn off. So I'm in the middle of m music, middle of a song and it just click and everything, everything goes off. It's just one of those, again, quality of life things. It sounds simple, it sounds small, but it does, it's disruptive and it kind of messes with the flow and this is not something I had to deal with before. Um, so there is that. But I was saying there is an option to turn the screen off and again, it's buried. It's buried in like a bunch of menus. Um, I can show you here real quick. If you hold down the settings button, uh, you could go to general, I think it is. Buried on the settings, not intuitive at all. It's taken me, literally it took me like three minutes to, to find it and I've stopped it before. But go to general, go to OLED care, go to device self-care, 
go to energy savings and then there's an actual screen off button. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Was it that hard before? Uh, and this can turn up the screen without turning up the TV so I can leave my, my sound on. Um, another annoying thing, there used to be an option if you had an LG TV before, you might remember, where you can kind of take the, the pointer and just point to like the corners of the screen to get info. So now when you do that, it doesn't actually show the full info. Um, it gives you a short info and I just found out. There is a shorter way to do it, but it's still not as short as it used to be. So click in the corner, you get the current thing, and then instead of clicking the dot, you can click this, and it will bring that menu up. What's interesting here is that I'm pretty sure the LG added this in a firmware update. This was not there. I remember looking for this when I first got the TV, and it was not there. Um, and I was like, why would they get rid of that? So maybe they re-added it, which is a good thing. Um, so it is there. It's, it's, it's not as intuitive, but it is there. So yeah. There are some perks. Um, the picture quality is great. The game optimizer is great. Um, I need to point out that the 4K 120 and the VRR, the combination of the PS5 now having support for that and the um, TV in the Anthem, by the way, uh, which is a 4K 120, you know, pass through. Everything just works. That part of it works. So gaming on this TV is a dream and it really has taken like the PS5 in particular to the next level. Now I can get 4K, with VRR and unlock frame rates for a lot of at least Sony first party games, which takes things like Uncharted that used to be like 4K 30 frames per second. And if you really were, you know, not like in 30, um, now you can get 4K 50, not quite 60, but 50, which feels pretty darn close to 60. So you can get the, you know, the best of all worlds in a sense. Um, and then the performance mode that used to be, you know, capped at 60, now goes up to like 100 FPS. It's awesome. TV supports it, the Anthem supports it, everything works out beautifully. Um, certain games that, you know, like Resident Evil Village was a game that with Ray Tracing on ran like in the 50s. Now with VRR, it feels smooth and you would not know the difference at all between having a lock 60 and having it run like in the 50s. Um, that's what VRR does um, and, and it works great. So that part of it is great. The pitch quality is great. The processing is great. If you're in the market for a TV that's a larger, a premium TV to give you the ultimate picture quality that is larger than 55 or 65 inches, that's what QD OLED stops. This is to me is the best option bar none. Um, I think it's overall better than the A90J from Sony simply because the gaming experience is better. It has better support for gaming. It has VRR, G-Sync, FreeSync support. It has four HDMI 2.1 ports as opposed to the only two with the Sony. There's other little nuances, but needless to say, gaming is better on here. And ultimately, I think the picture quality is also a little bit better. And you, it trades blows, but it does get brighter than A90J, that's for sure. Um, right now, super, super uh, happy. Highly recommend the G2. C2 also would be great, but this pushes, pushes uh, just a little bit further. and has the nice aesthetic and has the flush wall mount, which also is, is desirable for, for me, at least for my space. So, I'm happy, hope you enjoyed this review and my impressions. And yeah, I'm enjoying the space, man. I wish I just had more time to just, <laughs> to just lounge out in here. But when I am in here, when I sit in that chair, and fire up a game or fire up a movie, it is an awesome, awesome experience. So till next time, True Techno Gamer, please like, subscribe. I appreciate the support. See you in the next video.